There, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Well, once again on this um, really beautiful fall morning, we ask you to come and be with us, to be our leader and our guide this hour as we enter into this holy and sacred place, which is your scripture, an encounter with Jesus Christ in this special way that you've given the church. We ask you, Lord, to um, bless us as we look at the words the Holy Spirit inspired St. Luke to write down. And with the help of that spirit to discern them rightly, put them in place in our minds and our hearts, just the way you want them to be. In Christ's holy name I pray, amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right, we continue to move rather slowly through uh, the Gospel of Luke. We got up to the middle of the chapter 8. I'm satisfied with the pace so far. We may actually have to pick it up and skip sections. But I have a hard time, when I think about doing that, deciding what to skip because, you know, just uh, Luke condenses a lot in a short number of chapters. So um, we're still in Galilee, though we're getting to the end of the portion of Jesus' mission in Galilee, according to Luke. And in chapter 9, we're in chapter 8 now, but in the middle of chapter 9, he will begin the journey to Jerusalem, which is going to be about 10 chapters in Luke it's kind of hard to track exactly where he is by reading Luke. It's, maybe he Luke didn't intend us to do that. But, he, but it's kind of cir circuitous. But he is going to go through Samaria. And that's significant. But we're not quite there yet. Last week we had him going on the other side, the opposite side of Galilee, the scripture says. Uh, the Sea of Galilee to uh, uh, the other side of the Golan Heights, to the area of the Decapolis. He went to Gadara, and uh, that's where he encountered the Gadarean demoniac, where he displayed, according to my count, about the tenth miracle. And in that, he's already cast out demons, but he encounters a very powerful uh, evil, doesn't he? Because he asks this demon, what's your name? And he says, Legion, for we are many. Sounds very ominous and spooky, doesn't it? You know, so. But still, to Jesus, it's just like stomping out bugs and uh, he casts them out into the sea the people are afraid he leaves he leaves the, the healed man though there to spread the good word and I told you in the other gospels he records Jesus going back again another time and those people had a much better reception of him I think because of the witness of this man who knew the love of God alright he says in verse 40 of chapter 8 on his return return from where will return from Gadara okay He's back now, and um, we don't exactly know where. Uh, you know, I like to connect the dots, and sometimes it's easier than others. But anyway, let's just leave it at that. On his return, Jesus was welcomed by the crowd, for they were all there waiting for him. And suddenly there came a man named Jairus, who was president of the synagogue. Now, was that the synagogue of Capernaum or of Magdala? I'm not sure. He fell at Jesus' feet and pleaded with him to come to his house because he had an only daughter about 12 years old who was dying. This sounds familiar to the story of the centurion, right? Which was in Capernaum, where the, the, the Roman leader of the garrison that was stationed in, in, in um, Capernaum sent word to Jesus, my son or my servant, he says, we're not sure which, is sick and dying. And Jesus offers to come to his house but he's the one that says, that's not necessary. You can do it from there. And that's where we saw Jesus do it from there. He says, I'm not worthy that you should come under the roof of my house, right? And Jesus commends him for his faith. Now Jairus, who's the head of the synagogue, also has a sick child, but he asked Jesus to come there. So I think that's significant to point out. And Jesus is going to go. Well, he, he said, look, if I have the authority to command men to do whatever I want, then you certainly have the authority to over sickness and death. But that's, you know, uh, I mean, he, he believed that, and, and, but Jairus evidently wasn't quite there. I think Jairus maybe needed a little booster shot to his faith, and Jesus is about to give it to him. All right. So on the way there, we have the woman with the hemorrhage. For the past 12 years, we know from Mark that she had gone bankrupt seeking doctors, you know, and trying to get well, and she still wasn't well. 
But Luke just says no one had been able to cure. She came up behind him, Jesus, and touched the fringe of his cloak. Again, Mark tells us she believed if I can just make contact, even if it's just the hem, you know, one of the little threads hanging down, I'll be healed. And so she does that in a crowd of people. Now, she was not allowed by law, the law, to do that because she was considered to be unclean because of the, the hemorrhage. And she knew that. That's why she didn't just come up to Jesus and say, heal me or hug him or do anything like that. She says, I will kind of steal one, <laughs> right? And she did that. And Jesus stops and says, who touched me? Peter says, Master, the crowd's all around you pushing. In other words, everybody's touching you. What do you mean? But this was a different touch. Jesus said, somebody touched me. I felt that power had gone out of me. Now, we've talked about several times something that Jesus is going to make pretty explicit now. I've told you that a lot of his healings were coupled with what he wanted them to understand about his superior spiritual authority and power. Because they all have been taught that even the holiest men, if they encountered or touched something that was unclean, blood or a dead person or a tax collector or a sinner or uh, a person with leprosy, that what would happen to them? They would become unclean, right? The holiest of them would have to go through a whole series of ritual cleansings, you know, before they could even go back to the synagogue or serve in the temple or whatever, or be with good people again. Right? But Jesus is trying to say, no, there's new wine here. That's why we need new wineskins. And what I'm trying to demonstrate, what I'm bringing into the world that I have and that I'm going to give to you, which will be the next part of what he's trying to teach them, is a power, a grace superior to that which you knew in the old. When I touch the unclean, I do not become unclean. They become clean. Right? And then he would couple that with a miracle very often. So they could see. Because they would say, oh, he just touched the leper. But the leper got healed. So, so those who were so encased in their preconceived ideas and prejudice would just overlook the miracle. You know, and say, well, no, he can't be from God. He just did something that was against the Mosaic law. But Jesus would say, if you have eyes, see. If you have ears, hear. He was looking for a few people who would go past that and at least say, yeah, but the leper got cured. The dead person got up and walked away. The paralytic got up. So maybe there's, maybe we need to rethink, right, the presupposed condition here. And that's what he's trying to break through. And some are getting it. His numbers are growing here a little bit. But here he explicitly says, when she touched me, power went out of me. He said it. What I've been trying to say, he's been implying. Now he just says it. He didn't say, wait a minute, I just felt some uncleanness get into me. I didn't, cause somebody cut that tassel off. That wasn't it, did he? He said, no, no. But a lot of people were touching him. So there must be a way that she touched him that was different from all the people who just wanted to be seen with the rabbi and the famous prophet and teacher, right? She approached him with humility and, more, and mostly with faith, right? So somehow the way she touched him was different because he didn't say power's been going out of me like crazy, you know, I've just been sparking electricity to all these people touching. That's not what he said, right? Larry? Oh, I'm sorry. Hey, okay. Yeah, good, good job there. I think you just said the word and the word is faith. Right. But it seems that look, there's, an under, there's a, a sub-theme in this gospel because we're seeing that all along. And in, in, in this particular chapter, if you recall, Jesus saying, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and act on it. Right. And so the two things that I'm seeing are forgiveness and faith. Remember the uh, faith of the guys who brought in their friend? And it, That's right. Your sins are forgiven. So their faith and his sin. And those were like, was so like, we've seen faith working in different ways. Yes. Sometimes it's the sick person. Sometimes it's the parent. Sometimes it's the, the, uh, uh, the friends. Yeah. Sometimes it's just Jesus wanting to do something and show them his power. So we can't pigeonhole how faith works. Let's also say this. Will you agree? 
When he says your faith heals you, it doesn't mean you had some power in you that made you better. That's not what that means. The grace of God made them better. The grace of God does the forgiveness. The grace of God does the healing. But somehow or another, faith allows us to unlock or apply the grace of God to a situation. That's how it works. If you had crops and you had a pipe going to your irrigation system that kept the crops alive, you wouldn't say the pipe is keeping my crops alive. It's the water, right? But the way you're getting the water to the crops is that conduit, right? That's the way we're connecting. That's why these other people touching Jesus did not plug them in to the power he had, but she, in her faith, did. Right. I, I, and I do agree. Uh, and, in fact, I, I have a prayer down here that uh, Mother Teresa, St. Teresa, had prayed. Um, because, as you know, and John the Cross, they're dark nights, and she had many, many experiences of she didn't feel the presence of God, but yet, through her faith, knowing that God's working in her heart and life, you know, she had this prayer that she prayed every day. Jesus in my heart, I believe in your tender love for me. I love you. And I've been teaching that to a lot of the men of the, uh, the Calhoun as well. That you may feel despondent. You may feel like things are crushing in around you. But know that God is there. And it's your faith in knowing Him. Like it says here in Scripture. The, you've heard the Word of God and now act on it. Right. Acting on it is your trusting. That Acting is a, is, a, is a decision of your will. Your emotions, how you feel, may or may not fall in line. But God has given us a will to, to do and make decisions based on what we know is true anyway. And that's what the whole dark night of the soul is about, the way I read it through the saints that have experienced that. That my emotion of feeling the presence of God is not strong right now. And I know I've been tested, and Jesus basically saying, do you love me or do you love the way I make you feel? And you have to make a decision that, no, I love you anyway. I love you because of what I know is true. And that's, that's, a, that's a very high level of spirituality. If you, if you read about what the great spiritual masters have said through the various stages of spiritual maturity, um, it's not one I particularly hope to get to because <laughs> it sounds awful. But, and yet it, it seems to be a common experience of those chosen that way. Let's, let's push on here. Uh, oh, let me, let me do our little picture. So I've told you, I think, before that in Magdala, which is making me think we're in Magdala now, maybe I'm just prejudiced by it, there is a church, there is a Father Juan Solano, a Mexican priest, who has uh, been a theologian and a teacher in seminaries most of his life, and including uh, the seminaries in Jerusalem. He had a, a firm conviction that God wanted him to build a special Catholic church in Magdala, which is saying something because there are no Christians in Magdala. He wasn't going to build them a new parish church. He's building a church where there are no Christians, right? So he went to Magdala to build this church. The church is now built. He only started in 2005. But there's all kinds of cool God stuff associated with this. He calls it Duke in Altum. Uh, go out into the deep. Go out into the deep. That's his theme. And the only piece of land he could find was actually outside of the modern city of Magdala. Perhaps they didn't want a Christian church right in town, right? But the, the, the plot of land he bought when they started digging found out was the archaeological site of the original city of Magdala, which they had never found before then, all right? So in addition to the church, he's got this archaeological dig, which is good. He's trying to build also a guest house there, about a 70 room guest house, which is not yet complete. In this uh, church, which is beautiful, run by volunteers, the only Christians are visitors and pilgrims. The only masses that are done there are the ones that pilgrims come with their priest and they do a mass there, right? So the upper, the upper church in the uh, atrium is called, is dedicated to the women of the Bible, Old and New Testament. And on the pillars are, they're dedicated to the various women, and there's one to all the holy unnamed women of the world. So that includes all of you ladies, right? <laughs> right. Then in the sanctuary, which is very interesting, the altar is on a boat, a first century boat, on an infinity pool. And the back wall is glass, so the water goes outside, and it runs down the sides of the sanctuary too, and the altar itself looks like it's on water. Okay? So that's kind of unusual. 
All right, and then and then the crypt or the lower church, uh, they built into a replica of a first century synagogue except with an altar in the middle of it, okay? And they found out the stones they uncovered where they want to build it were the original stones of the marketplace of Magdala. So that floor is the floor of Magdala, possibly where Jesus encountered Mary the Magdalene, right? Because it had not ever been, a big basilica has not been built there, a city had not been built on this site. This remained basically uncovered until Father Solano started digging around. So it's really cool. And in this lower... A chapel called the Encounter Chapel. He had, I don't remember the name of the, uh, the artist, a, on a big wall, probably 10 by 20, he had this, this uh, picture drawn. And it's of the woman that we're talking about here. And he, the, I think he really captured... So, all right. So there's the little woman's hand coming in, touching the hem of the garment, and I, I love that burst of energy right there. You see that? So you have the, all these other rough feet around. And, you, and if you were standing there, you'd come up to about half the height of this, uh, this, this uh, portrait. Okay? So this foot's bigger than you. All these feet are there. And then her little hand coming in and touching the hem of the garment and the energy bursting. And it's the, and it's the story we're reading about. And I just... It just knocks your socks off. I mean, in this simple little room, this, this thing takes up the whole wall, and you're not expecting it. I wasn't. I had no idea it was there. We only went there because we are about to pass through, right? right? And I happened to read about this church, and I asked our guide, can we go there? And he said, well, yeah, if I can find it. So we went and found it. And I think he's taking everyone there, right? So they knocked his socks off, too. So it was, it was, uh, it was really gorgeous. Um, that's one of the gifts of pilgrimage, the un unexpected finds. So there's that. And, and Father Ray, who was with us, said, we need a copy of that for our reconciliation room. So that's, that's where it hangs. That's why I just went and got it. I better put it back. <laughs> and hopefully I won't drop it and break it along the way. Yeah. All right. So I just thought that was a nice visual aid for you today. But it's, it's just a, a, a beautiful place. And it depicts, I think, captures a beautiful event that's in Luke and Mark. That, that's what it is. That's what it is. And I wish I knew the artist's name, but I, I don't. I'm usually better at it than that, but I think he's tucked away in the frame somewhere. One of the things you notice when you walk in the, first, the front door, the first room here on the left, um, the first room on the left is the healing of Jairus' daughter. The baby right. is there, the girl is laying in the bed, right. Jesus is there. So Father Solano thinks, thinks Magdala. And it kind of makes sense if you want to just follow the topography of the rest of the story here going forward. Maybe it was, maybe it wasn't, but um, it doesn't say. So, uh, but he thought, and it works for me. You know, I love it when I find somebody that agrees with me. Yeah. <laughs> Every now and then. And I said, yes, he'd put it in Magdala, because that's my thing. All right. Now, he's going to have the first training mission, the next event. No, wait a minute. I forgot the healing of the woman. While he was still speaking, when he said, your faith has saved you, go and speak, go in peace, someone arrived from the house of the president of the synagogue. We forgot about him. He said, your daughter has died. Do not trouble the master any further. But Jesus heard this and he spoke to the man, the president of the synagogue, who was with him in the crowd, right? And he says, do not be afraid, only have faith, and she will be saved. Now, he had just seen the woman healed, and Jesus says, your faith saved you. So I think maybe that was a little energy drink he needed to boost him up, right? Because otherwise they may have come and said, your daughter died. He may have thought, oh, we were too late. I failed. But Jesus says, no, have faith and she will be saved too. Just put it together. All right. When he came to the house, he allowed no one to go in with him except Peter and John and James. And the child's father and mother, they were all crying and mourning for her. But Jesus said, stop crying. She is not dead, but asleep. But they ridiculed him, knowing that she was dead. There's no pulse. There's no breathing. She's blue. We know what, what's going on, right? They ridiculed him. But taking her by the hand, he touched her. Right? And said and spoke to her, child, get up. Tabitha Kum, that's in the, the other scripture. 
And her spirit returned and she got up at that very moment. Then he told them to give her something to eat. Her parents were astonished, but he ordered them not to tell anyone what had happened. Child, get up. By the way, I missed over a very important point. When the woman, trembling and afraid that she's going to be stoned to death because she'd been busted for, for breaking the law, approaches him, how did Jesus... I mean, she said, well, I got my healing, now I'm going to get paid. At least I'm going to get stoned to death well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right? So she approaches, and you can just imagine her terror. There's this group of, you know, men in good standing, and she's just broken the law. They all know it. She knows it, and she's done it willfully. Well, how does Jesus address her? Daughter. daughter. Right. My daughter. Right. Not woman or anything like that. He wants her to relax. He says, daughter. And I think that that's gold, right? Your faith has saved you. Nobody's stoning you here to death. You didn't steal anything from me, right? I was hoping you'd come up and touch me. That was yours. Your story is going to be recorded for perpetuity. And I wanted all these people to see why they were touching me one way, you touched me another way, you're healed. All right? Good work, daughter. All right? I love that. All right. All right, so now he hears the child, and this is yet another miracle. Now he's raised somebody, the second person from the dead. Okay? All right. Now we get to the mission of the twelve. Jesus is going to now do something totally new. He's been demonstrating his authority over storms, over sin, over devils, over sickness, over paralysis, over leprosy, right? But now he's going to start giving it away. It's new, right? Stage one is you have to believe I've got it. Now if you can believe it, accept it, I want you to understand I'm going to delegate this power to you first to the twelve. Later on, he's going to give it to even more. In this chapter, actually. Um, all right. He gave them authority over devils and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. And he said to them, take nothing for the journey, neither staff, nor haversack, nor bread, nor money. Do not have a spare tunic. Do not worry about your next meal, where you're going to stay, if you've got the right clothes. Nothing. I want you to be utterly, totally dependent on God. Because if you succeed, I want you to understand it's only because of that. Whatever house you enter, stay there, and when you leave, let your departure be from there. <coughs> As for those who do not welcome you, when you leave their town, shake the dust from your feet as evidence against them. That's great advice. He's going to tell the 72 to do the same thing. He's not going to say everywhere you go you're going to hit a home run. Mickey Mantle struck out a lot, okay? But he had to swing, all right? He said, I want you to go out there swinging. And if you go into a village and they're not interested in you, don't sit there and say, Sit there and say, they didn't love me. I failed. Oh, I'm such a loser. Why don't they want what I have? Just shake the dust off your feet and move on. That's what Jesus said, right? He's going to do it himself, actually. All right, so he sent them out. While he's waiting, there's this little interlude here. Meanwhile, Herod the Tetrarch had heard about all that was going on. Another reason I think he's down in Magdala, because uh, uh, Tiberius is only about a stone throw, right? Long, well, half a mile, maybe a mile further down the coast. He's in Herod's backyard. Herod hears about this guy. Now, we don't get from the scripture that Herod is necessarily antagonistic towards Jesus. He's curious about him. You know, when... Uh, when Pilate, they bring him to Pilate and Pilate has him in custody and he hears that Herod's in town for the Passover he sends him over to Herod because he heard he's from his territory, one of his citizens because this is part of Herod's little chunk of uh, land and, and then Herod questions him and he wants him to do uh, some tricks and then when Jesus does it, he sends him back but he doesn't say, you know, crucify him it doesn't look like he's necessarily looking for a Messiah, he wasn't a Jew by the way right? He just, he just hears there's this, what they call a prophet, you know, these superstitious Jews, doing all these tricks. I'd like to see some myself. But we don't get that he's particularly worried about. 
he wasn't really worried about John the Baptist. He didn't like that John the Baptist spoke badly about him being in an sensuous affair with his brother's wife. But he was, John the Baptist was executed because the brother's wife would didn't like it. But Herod seems to be kind of a ambivalent, yes. passive, yes. aggressive milk toast, actually. So, uh, yes. all right. So, anyway, Herod had heard about all that was going on. He was puzzled because some people were saying that John had risen from the dead, others that Elijah had reappeared, still so others that one of the ancient prophets had come back to life. That's kind of the scuttlebutt that's going on out there, right? But Herod said, John, I beheaded him. So who is this that I hear such reports about? And he was anxious to see him, but, but not anxious to kill him, right? By the way, how would we know that's what Herod was thinking and saying in his inner court? There was a clue in the previous chapter. Because actually he didn't want to kill him from the beginning. No, he didn't. But how, how, do, how do we know Herod's attitude? How do we know he made these comments here? I'm just... I'm just that's right. When they mentioned the women that followed Jesus, one of them was Susanna, wife of Chusa, who was in Herod's court. So it looks like Susanna and maybe Chusa, two, two people in Herod's court, were believers. So just, you know, that was mentioned, maybe for a reason, so we can answer that small question, which matters to maybe not many, but uh, there it is. That's the answer, I think. They just told us that some in the presence knew Herod. They were in his court. They worked for him. And Herod evidently didn't have a big problem with it. All right. On their return, now we're talking about the 12 he sent out. The apostles gave him an account of all they had done. Then he took them with him and withdrew towards a town called Bethsaida. Towards Bethsaida, for my journey topography to work they were going towards Bethsaida which means just going east but I don't know if they made it there where they could be by themselves but the crowds got to know and they went after them and he made them welcome talked to them about the kingdom of God and he cured those who were in need of healing in the other scriptures right here it said when they came back and told Jesus they were very happy it's in Matthew, Mark, and John too, I think. And he said, they were ecstatic. He said, it worked. We went, we got, people got healed in your name. We cast out demons in your name. And it says that Jesus at that moment had sort of a ecstatic eruption of joy. He praised God for revealing these things to the little, one, little ones and hiding it, hiding it from the learned, right? He was happy. Because they were happy. He had sent these newbies out, his children out, and they were growing up. They were growing up. They were now having more faith in their ability to, to exercise miracle power in his name, which is going to be very important. So this next experiment, his timing was that maybe they can do it now, and it worked, and it makes him very happy. And I've said before, this reminds me a lot when I used to coach Little League football. And we would practice and practice and practice, especially the new little guys, you know, and just teaching them some fundamentals, and they don't have all the confidence in the world. They act like they're the greatest football player in the world, but they actually don't know. And then we would go out, and my team's always won, so we would go out. First game, and we would win, and they would just be so excited. It worked, coach, it worked. You said we'd win, and we did, and it would just make me so happy. And so I, I, I just, I, I, I like, I think of that, and I like, the fact that Jesus was happy because they were succeeding. Good one for the team. Right. He's a, he's a good coach. He's a good, he's a good father, actually. Right? That was good. All right. All right, so they go off. They're going to have a debriefing, maybe a retreat, at least they think they're going to, to a secluded place. And here's the people find him. And this is where he has Matthew's account of the multiplication of the loaves and the fish which is in all four Gospels, one of the few stories that's in all four Gospels, the five loaves and the two fish, he, he takes all that they have, breaks the bread, distributes it, and there's way more left over than they even started with. All kinds of Eucharistic imagery here, okay? It's hard to point down from the Gospels, though, exactly where that happened. But anyway, so he does, we know, we can agree it's still on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. 
So that happens here. It's significant, people say, why, why did he ask for five loaves and two fish? Or why were there five loaves and two fish, not four loaves and six fish? Or, you know, I said, it's because of what they had. I mean, I'm just that simple. He wanted them to take inventory. He wanted to know, what do you have? And they said five loaves and two fish because that's what they had. And then he asked for all of it. I think that's important. It was not going to be enough, and he didn't need any of it to do what he was going to do, but he wanted them to give him all they had, and in exchange he gave them pressed down, shaken together, running over, abundance return, right? I think that's the deepest theological message here. He's also trying to set them up for the Eucharist, which in John would happen the next day, the Bread of Life discourse. Luke skips over that. He now takes Jesus to an event that we know in Matthew happens at Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Philippi, in Israel, there's a little, what do you call it, isthmus, a little part of land that sticks way up at the top, in the northeast corner of it. At the top is Mount Hermon, and Caesarea Philippi is at the foothills of Mount Hermon. They're not really letting tourists go there much anymore because on the left side of it, the west side of it is southern Lebanon, which is somewhat unstable sometimes, and then on the east side of it is Syria, which was a hotbed of violence. So uh, I got to go there one time, but this last time they wouldn't let us go that far north, up into that area. So they're up in that area, Mount Hermon, and, and Caesarea Philippi, now they're in the kingdom of Philip, and Philip had built a, uh, a temple to Caesar, kind of a kiss up, who is, he's in power because of the Roman Caesar, right? So he built a temple to Caesar, the god. And he called it Caesarea Philippi. Because he also had a summer home for himself there. And, and this foothill is more like a, a plateau. And on top was this, in ancient times, it's not there anymore, this magnificent temple made of marble that just dominated the valley below. The valley below is the, uh, the headwaters of the Jordan River. There's a series of springs there that come up and they come together and they start the Jordan River that goes down to the Sea of Galilee. One of the major springs at that time came out of a cave at the bottom of that hill, right below where that temple was, just gush forth water. It's just a trickle now because of all of the cave-ins. But the ancients used to think that was, that was one of the gates to the underworld, Hades. Okay? They would throw sacrifices in there to placate the demons so they wouldn't come out and harass everyone. They thought the hills around there were inhabited by the pagan god Pan. Panic, the, the god of fear. All right, so this is not exactly holy land to the Jews, right? So they're up there, and, and it's important because this is where Peter's going to make his profession of faith. And Jesus is going to say, with the backdrop of that pagan temple right behind him, on top of that big monolith of rock, with the gate of Hades below it, he says, Thou art Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. The fifth gospel. The location gives so much insight into why he said it that way and what it means, and what it meant to them, and what it could mean to us if we understand that, right? So he used, he used the location once again, and what they saw as a visual. So yeah, this is a pagan temple, powerless against evil, on top of this rock, and it has some temporal beauty to it, but it isn't going to last. No, my church is going to be built on the apostles, especially you, Peter. And, and just ironically, where is the tomb of Peter? It's under St. Peter's Basilica, right? The, the mother church of the universal church, right? So on, on you, Peter, I will build my church. And you will have the power the old religions didn't have, which is to go in to rescue the souls in Hades. Okay, not hell. Hades, all right? <coughs> Balance of powers change. New wine. Much better than the old, all right? So this is where they're at. Uh, where Jesus says, Who do the crowd say that I am? They say, Some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, others again, one of the ancient prophets, just like they told Herod. But you, he said, Who do you say that I am? It was Peter, who was Simon up to now, who spoke up. You are the Christ of God. But he gave them strict orders and charged them not to say this to anyone. Now he's beginning, going to begin to talk about going to Jerusalem. He says, the Son of Man is destined to suffer grievously. 
to be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be put to death. Again, in the other Gospels, we know that Peter, who just been named the vicar of Christ, is going to say, that will not happen to me, you. And he says, get behind me, Satan. You're not thinking like a man of God. You're thinking about like men think, right? But he's telling them now, he's being to speak specifically that he's going to be put to death. And he says to be raised up on the third day. But they obviously don't know what that means. Then he says this hard thing. Then speaking to all, he said, if anyone wants to be a follower of mine, let him renounce himself and take up his cross every day and follow me. Please consider what that would have meant to them. Yes. All our life we talk about taking your cross, carrying your cross, yada, yada, yada. But what was the cross to these people? Torture, death. Torture, death. It, was, it was what their dreaded enemies used to, cruci to kill the worst criminals because it was the most painful way they could think of of executing someone. Right? Publicly humiliating, excruciating pain and a slow agonizing death in front of your loved ones and everyone else. To display the power of Rome and what happens if you dare to rise up against her, right? That's what the cross was to these people. You know, somebody said, you must carry your electric chair every day. Pick up your electric chair and carry it around. You know, it's kind of ooky when you think of it that right. So, so I just want you, this is what he says to them. He just said, I'm going to be put to death. And they may be thinking, ooh, I hope it's not with a cross. All right? Because lots of people were crucified. We know from Josephus and others, that's the way they did it. Right? Unless you were a Roman citizen. Then they beheaded you because that was nicer. It's quicker. Peter was crucified in Rome about 35 years later. All right. He says, anyone who wants to save his life will lose it. Anyone who loses his life for my sake will save it. That's one of those ironies in the kingdom. If you want to be rich, make yourself poor. If you want to be the greatest, make yourself the least. If you want to save your life, give it away. You know, it's just the thinking of the world flipped on its head. He says, what benefit is it to anyone to win the whole world and forfeit his very life? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words of him, the Son of God will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. He says, I tell you truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. So he's talking about the kingdom of God being an imminent thing. Obviously not something that's only going to happen at the end of time. Right? Jesus says it's coming pretty soon. And whether you want to call that at the resurrection or at the destruction of Jerusalem, which happened in 70 A.D., there were people alive then that saw those events, either one. Okay. The transfiguration, and I would refer you to in our mission of Messiah, which we haven't pointed to much lately, we're back into sections that it's talking about. And I would refer you to, to, to read about page, uh, I think, 92 is where, yeah, 92 is where he begins talking about the journey to Jerusalem, beginning with the transfiguration. And what it meant. And it's, he's going to do a lot better job than we can right here. But the next thing is the transfiguration. Which some people think was at Mount Hermon. Which was right there. Other people think it was at Mount Tabor. Which is further down in the middle of Galilee. It really could be either way. There's arguments for both. Uh, you can't say because. I, uh, like I have said I think. It must be Mount Hermon because it was right there. But it does say it was eight days later. So that would have been time to go to Mount Tabor. So it doesn't matter. About eight days after this, at Caesarea Philippi, he took with him Peter, John, and James and went up the mountain to pray. And it happened then as he was praying, the aspect of his face was changed. His clothing became sparkling white, similar to what he's going to look like after the resurrection. And suddenly there were two men talking to him. They were Moses and Elijah. Interesting. Appearing in glory. And they were speaking of his passing, or of his exodus, of his exodus, which he was to accomplish in Jerusalem. So there's all kinds of mosaic imagery here. And Tim Gray talks about it a lot. Going up on the mountain, right? And they are seeing Moses, for one, to talk about his own exodus, his way out of. And his way out of is going to be going to Jerusalem and his own death. 
right? But he's, he's having this executive committee meeting. So Moses and Elijah. Moses, a lot of the, theologians would say, represents the law, and Elijah represents the prophets. All of those things that spoke about Jesus in the, in the age of anticipation. All right? Also, two people that, if you read carefully, uh, we don't know what happened to their bodies. And I always like to point that out. In uh, the book of Jude, it refers to an apocryphal book called The Assumption of Moses, which we don't have. But it says that Michael and the devil fought over the body of Moses. In the scriptures, we know Moses went up into the mountain to die, but we don't know. What, there's, no, there's no grave, right? So we don't know what happened to him. Well, in that apocryphal book, it says Michael came down, won the battle, and took his body to, to heaven. Not necessarily when he's alive, but took the body there, okay? Elijah, how, did, how do we know Elijah left? Right, because Elisha witnessed it. They crossed the Jordan River. And the chariots came down, swooped him up, and took him to heaven. So I just thought it was very interesting. Really, the only two characters in the Old Testament that you could argue were assumed bodily into heaven are the two speaking here to him here in physical form. If you ever have any non-Catholic friends want to argue about the Catholic dogma of the Assumption of Mary, you could point to these and make an argument, okay, well, it appears God did this, has done this, so the only thing that's left is, not he can't do that or doesn't do that, is that would he do it for his mom? <laughs> yeah. Question, yes ma'am, I'm sorry. That would be the traditional way of thinking it. Only Mary and Jesus. But I'm saying there's an argument to be made to Moses and Elijah as well. Well, well, he can see them. Now, whether, whether he's seeing some manifestation of their spirit or he's actually seeing their bodies, their heavenly bodies, whether they were given a special prerogative of God like we, like we say the Blessed Mother did, we don't know. There's mystery here. I was just pointing that out to stir up trouble. <laughs> well, they appeared in glory. Yeah, they appeared in glory. They're not... They're not they're not in agony in Hades somewhere. They're talking to Jesus about his exodus, which they had both experienced. All right? They had their own exodus. And now, that's what he's talking about. They're talking about his passing, right? And they had to have knowledge that by somebody... He's conferring with them. Was he asking advice? What's it like to die and be assumed into heaven? I, we think, well, Jesus knows everything, but maybe not. Maybe, maybe he's talking to them. Maybe they're giving him encouragement. Because as the human part of Jesus, you may be thinking, this is about to get thick and sticky here. I know this. We're about to head to Jerusalem. Maybe they were there to just say, go get them. Right? You can do this thing, right? For the, for the witnesses there to Could be that too. Say, okay, now we're kind of getting it. Or right. Think about it later. Well, they're going to see a manifestation of Jesus that the others haven't seen and won't see until the resurrection. That's true. So maybe it was a strength booster for them. Maybe Jesus is given this experience. Well, I mean, he's going to have the experience. You know, it says he went up on the mountain to pray by himself all the time. So we don't know if he did this on a regular basis. <laughs> but this time he took Peter, James, and John with him. They saw it and recorded it, right? So maybe this time he's taking them and says, you know, what? I've already sent you out to start exercising my authority, it's time for you, my executive committee, to start getting tooled up because we're going to up this thing to another level. And now I'm going to display myself to you in another way. If you haven't already gotten it, <laughs> that I'm something special of God, I mean, watch this. Right, watch this. All right, that's right. So all those things are, are true. Uh, Peter and his companions were heavy with sleep, but they woke up. <laughs> <laughs> they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. As these were leaving, Peter said to Jesus, does Peter just think, I've just got to say something? <laughs> you know, I, I, maybe. Could you have said something? I, I had just been thinking. I know, all right. But Peter thinks he's got to say something. I've got to say something intelligent, I guess. 
He says, Master, it's wonderful for us to be here, so let us make three shelters. This was the Feast of Tabernacles, or the Feast of Shelters, where the Jews would build temporary shelters. They still do that, Orthodox, and they live in them for a week, and this was to remember when they were in the desert, right? So, this is, so he says, well, I, this is the Feast of Shelters. I'll build three shelters for you and Elijah and Moses. He did not know what he was saying. He's just running his mouth. And as he was saying this, a cloud came and covered them with a shadow. Again, mosaic imagery, remember? Moses up on Mount Sinai and the cloud covered Mount Sinai. And then they heard the voice from the cloud say, just like the Israelites heard. God speaking to them when he was speaking to Moses. The voice said, this is my son, the chosen one. Listen to him. Don't talk. Listen. <laughs> right? Listen to him. And after the voice had spoken, Jesus was, Jesus was found alone with the apostles still. The disciples kept silence then, finally. And at that time, told no one what they had seen. If you go back and read Deuteronomy 18, Moses on Mount Sinai, there's all kinds of, you know, laser connections here that Luke would like us to see. All right? Jesus is the new Moses. And the more we understand about the ministry and the mission of Moses, the more we kind of understand how Jesus... Right? All right, on the way down, they encounter the epileptic demoniac. They're coming down the following day. A large crowd was there to meet him with the rest of the apostles. Suddenly a man in the crowd cried out, Master, I implore you to look at my son. He is my only child. A spirit has suddenly taken hold of him. And all at once it gives a sudden cry and throws the boy into convulsions with foaming at the mouth. <coughs> it is slow to leave him. And when it does, it leaves the boy worn out. I begged your disciples to drive it out, and they could not. Hmm. So these disciples, the apostles at least, had already gone out and found they had authority at least over some, some demons. But obviously we're getting, the, we're getting the picture here that there's different types of demons, right? Maybe just like there's choirs of angels. Choir, these are fallen angels, right? So they have different levels of authority, I guess. It's, uh, they could not. Jesus says, faithless and perverse generation, how much longer must I be among you? Put up with you. Bring your Sunday to me. Even while the boy was coming, the devil threw him to the ground in convulsion. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, cured the boy, and gave him back to his father. And everyone was awestruck by the greatness of God. The greatness of God in Jesus. The greatness of God for sure. But now they've got to figure out, it manifested himself in Jesus. Not our Pharisees, not our priests, not even the disciples of Jesus, but in Jesus. This demon. I, I mean, I, I know people would say, well, this kid obviously had epilepsy. Let's just take it at the narrative value right here, okay? Luke is telling us that epilepsy, in his case, was caused by, by demons, all right? That he was having some other manifestation, spiritual one. And Jesus healed him and cast this one out, even one that the others could not. Why is who he said he was? In the other Gospels, it says the apostles asked him, why couldn't we do it? He said, this one needs prayer and fasting. Okay. While everyone was full of admiration for him, all he did, he said to his disciples, For your part, you must have these words constantly in mind. The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the power of men. Even while you're seeing all these great things, you must fight against what the others are concluding. That I'm going to be the general, the king, the Messiah, according to what they want the Messiah to be, that's going to lead them into something they're not going to see. And they're going to be disappointed enough that most of them are going to leave. You have to keep in mind all along. I'm telling you now so it won't rock your world too bad when it happens, right? Keep them in mind. The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the power of men. But they did not understand what he said. It was hidden from them so that they should not see the meaning of it. And they were afraid to ask him about it. An argument started between them about which of them was the greatest. <laughs> Jesus knew what thoughts were going through their minds. And he took a little child whom he set by his side. And he said to them, anyone who welcomes this little child in my name welcomes me. Anyone who welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. The least among you all is the one who is the greatest. 
Another one of those ironies, right? John spoke up, Master, we saw someone driving out devils in your name, and because he is not with us, we tried to stop him. Why? It's our job. Is he jealous? You know, there's a scripture where Moses is appointing elders. He's now he's going to appoint the 72 elders now to distribute his authority. He'd already had 12 leaders of the 12 tribes. They're similar to what we're seeing here. He, he decided to have 72 more elders help him along. 70 came to the tent of meeting. Two did not. They were still back in the camp. Joshua gets all upset because when Moses prays for him, a spirit of prophecy falls on these elders and they all start giving prophet, they're speaking prophetically. And Joshua gets word that the two that didn't come. What are the names? Anyway, the two that were back, the two that were still back in the camp were also prophesying. Joshua says, stop them. Moses said, why? He said, well, they might, maybe the people think they're cooler than us or something. I don't know. He didn't, they didn't come and do it the right way. Moses said, I wish that all of God's people were prophets. All right? He wants to be generous with God's spirit. Jesus kind of says the same thing. John is sort of upset. He tells him to relax. Jesus said to him, you must not stop him. Anyone who's not against you is for you. Probably, you're going to, there's going to come a time that you will welcome allies that you didn't know about. Be great if you come across someone who's been a believer at a distance and it supports you. When you're on the run and you need a house to hide out in. Or you need a friend when you're sick or whatever. You know, I'm working well beyond just this circle of you 12 who are arguing who's the greatest. All right, things are happening out there. Remember, he left the guy in Gadara. He's got believers who are healed here and there. People who are firm in their belief of Jesus Christ and are following in their own way, even though they're not in the group. Okay. Now he's going to begin heading to Jerusalem. And he begins by going to Samaria. Chapter 9 through 17. And the chapters, I think, 6 and 7 in the Mission Messiah are going, to follow, are going to do this very well. Now it happened that as the time drew near for him to be taken up, he resolutely turned his face towards Jerusalem. That's a phrase that comes from um, Ezekiel. And Luke wants us to know that. Because Ezekiel was the prophet in the northern kingdom in Samaria that God called to go to Jerusalem with a message. That the Babylonians are coming and the false prophets are going to tell you resist them because God's going to help you. I'm telling you no. This is going to be a time of punishment. You're going to be destroyed. They don't like that. But it says he turns his face resolutely to Jerusalem and go and tell them the time of judgment has come and it's going to end up in your destruction. What is Jesus going to do? Same thing. Same thing. He's going to go and say, your Messiah has come. You've rejected him. All of the prophets' message for all these centuries that you acclaim as great leaders and teachers, you refuse to believe the ultimate message that they had. And because of that, judgment is going to come. We're going to get to the Olivet Discourse, which is in Mark, Matthew, and Luke, where Jesus is going to cry and look at Jerusalem and said, it's all going to be torn down. Which, he says, within this generation, which is 40 years, 40 years later, the Romans come in and level the place. Okay, the temple and everything. Make it illegal for Jews to live in the Holy Land. And basically, not just Jerusalem, but all the towns. Magdala, Capernaum, Nazareth. They're all leveled by the Roman legion, Titus and the legion. Because there had been a little rebellion. And the Jews succeeded in kicking the Roman garrisons out. For a short period of time. Well, Romans can't have that. I mean, Palestine to the Roman Empire is just this little outback, insignificant territory that is known for kind of religious crazy people, you know? Pilate getting, being made governor there, that was not a cushy position. That would be like a starter position where if you do good, you hope to get a better job later on, right? So them succeeding in kicking the Romans out and claiming they're now autonomous and free, the Romans cannot have that. So Titus is employed, he's in Persia, to bring the Roman legions down in their full force and to come in and teach these Jews a lesson. 
and not just take it back, but wipe them out and show the whole world what happens when you rise up against imperial Rome. Right? That's what's going on here. But that was to fulfill the prophecy. All right, so set your face towards Jerusalem and sent messengers ahead of them. These set out, they went into a Samaritan village to make preparations for him, but the people would not receive him because he was making for Jerusalem. The Samaritans didn't like, well, they were more generous towards the Galileans than they were towards the Judean Jews, right? Uh, but knowing they were going to Jerusalem and their loyalty was in Jerusalem, the Samaritans didn't like the Jews of Judea because the Jews of Judea called them half-breeds. But they were also looking for the Messiah. They also followed the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. In their own mind, they were still Israelites. But the Jews, you know, there's now a difference between Israelites and Jews, but the, the Jews did not consider them to be authentic. They were half-breeds. Because right? they, had, they had been forced to intermarry with pagan and Gentiles and everything. They didn't respect their form of worship or where they worshipped. The Mount Gerizim, right? Which is, they still have, they still live there. Still have a temple there, I think. Uh, all right, anyway. When they found out that that's where they were going, they rebuked him. And they went to another village. We're going to get to the mission of the 72 and 10, which is going to be immediately following, but Luke puts in this this story, this strophe here. As they traveled along, they met a man on the road who said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus said, Foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Another to whom he said, Follow me, replied, he replied, Let me go and bury my father first. Seems reasonable. But he answered, Leave the dead to bury the dead. Your duty is to go and spread the news of the kingdom of God. Another said, I will follow you, sir, but first let me go and say goodbye to my people at home. And Jesus said to him, once the hand is laid to the plow, no one who looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Hard words from good and gentle Jesus. At least it's clear that he's saying this is not an either or thing. Right? You need to be all in. That if it's just another line on your resume, this God thing, this Jesus thing... That's not making me Lord. Jesus is saying, I want you all in. There needs to be no other priority. Maybe he's using a little Middle Eastern hyperbole here. I don't know. But the point is very clear what he's meaning when he's talking to these people, right? There should be nothing else that comes first. If you're called, say yes. This is the first time he said that. Yes. yes. He's, he's speaking pretty clearly there, and I think to make a point. Now we have the 72. And I think it's because Jesus just learned a lesson. They march into a Samaritan town, and they don't want them. So what he decides to do, he's already, he's already remember, remember, had the 12 on their training mission. Now he's going to take 72, just like Moses did, right? He's going to give them certain authority, and he sent them out ahead of him. After this, the Lord appointed 72 and sent them ahead of him in pairs to all the towns and places he would be visiting. And he said to them, The harvest is rich, but the laborers are few. So ask the Lord of the harvest to send laborers to do his harvesting. Start off now, but look, I'm sending you out like lambs among wolves. Take no purse with you, no haversack, no sandals. Sounds familiar, right? Salute no one on the world, on the road. Whatever house you enter, let your first words be peace to this house. If a man of peace lives there, your peace will go and rest on him. If not, it will come back to you. Stay in the same house, taking what food and drink they have to offer. For the laborer deserves his wages, and do not move from house to house. Wherever you go into a town where they make you welcome, eat what is put before you. Cure those in it who are sick, and say, the kingdom of God is very near to you. Whenever you enter a town, they do not make you welcome. Go out into its streets and say, we wipe off the very dust of your town that clings to our feet, and leave it with you. Same advice. They've marched into a one. Now, he's got a pretty good entourage now, right? He's got 12 apostles. We know the women that follow him. Now he's going to pick 72 out of the other men. We don't know how many men and women were in the group, so it's a pretty sizable group now. I don't know if they're going to follow him all the way to Jerusalem, but they followed him at least this far. Before. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. So they've, mar they've marched into this one Samaritan town. They didn't welcome them when they found out they're going to Jerusalem. I think Jesus said, you know what? We need to do this different. 72 of you in pairs 
go to this list of towns, this is where we're going to go, and I want you to tell them I'm coming. I want you to cure their sick, cast out their devils, and tell them the kingdom of God is coming. Jesus is coming. He's going to tell you about the kingdom of God. And if they're open to it, just say, be ready. He'll be here in a few days, or a week, or two, whatever. And I think, I think what he was trying to do is prepare the way. Just marching into town unannounced and setting up a tent and having a camp meeting didn't work. Right? So if they get word from a couple of uh, disciples ahead of time that he's coming, you know, it's not as imposing as maybe hundreds of people arriving at the same time, just messengers, Jesus is coming. The one you've been hearing these stories about, he's coming here and he wants to tell you about the kingdom of God. They say, what's that? So you'll hear. He'll tell you all about it. You're going to like it. Right? Because it's going to include you which they had not heard from Jewish teachers or prophets. Okay? But he tells them, you're not going to have success everywhere you go either. Right? If they welcome you, good. Water the garden, grow what good fruit you can there. If they don't, don't whine and complain and sit, get rejected and come back with your tail between your legs. Dust, knock the dust off your feet and go on to the next one. Fortunately, he sent them in twos. Fortunately. You know, I always say, you know, if I was one of those ones, I'd be sure hoping I got somebody good. <laughs> you know? Yeah. All right. So Jesus has begun the journey to Jerusalem. He's just entered into the outer reaches of Samaria, and he's starting a new thing. This is where he says, that I was talking about, by the way, the 72 came back rejoicing. Right. I got my responses mixed up. Lord, they said... Even the devils submit to us when we use your name. And he said to them, I watched Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Where was that? The creation, before creation, I was there. The great battle of heaven. I saw Lucifer cast down. I was there. Look, I have given you power to tread upon serpents and scorpions. He's talking about demons, of course, but he puts it in the term of bugs. Poisonous bugs, to be sure. But, you know, a scorpion, even a little snake, as much scary as they are, just stomp them. Just stomp them. This is not you against some massive force. Me and you, it's you against bugs. All right? I have given you power to tread upon serpents and scorpions and the whole strength of the enemy. Nothing will ever hurt you. Yet do not rejoice that the spirits, the evil spirits, submit to you. Rejoice instead that your names are written in heaven. This is when he does it. Just at that time, filled with joy by the Holy Spirit, he said, I bless you, Father. He and God the Father are going to have a Holy Ghost moment. And it happens to him because he's happy, they're happy. I bless you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, for hiding these things from the learned and the clever and revealing them to little children. For that is what has pleased you to do. Everything has been entrusted to me by the Father, and no one knows who, knows who the Son is except the Father, and who the Father is except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. All right. Right. So he's done a new thing. He's delegated power, not just to the apostles, but even to the 72. He's now marching to Jerusalem. No, it's time to, he was telling me it's time to end, George. Which we need to do, because I'm past due. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. St. Jairus, St. Woman who used to have the hemorrhage, pray for us. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.